So now I'm confused. Pete told me on the way up here, he said, be real loud. Last time I preached, Uncle George said us too loud. So I don't know what you want to do now. <laughs> oh, goodness. Good morning, everybody. It sure is good to see everybody. Uh, me and Kylie won't be here next week. We're going to go to the Oklahoma City congregation next week. So we'll be gone, but Mom and the kids will be here. So y'all can have a party. Uh, before our reading this morning, let's turn to first, or excuse me, to Second Peter, the first chapter, and read verse sixteen. First Peter, or Second Peter, I'm gonna get this right in a minute. Second Peter, the first chapter, and verse sixteen. Here it says, "For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His Majesty." With these thoughts in mind, let's go to heaven, Father, in prayer. I want to thank Brother George for mentioning me in his prayer. The Lord knows I always need the prayers of the, of the faithful. You know, in our reading this morning, uh, the first declaration made says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. When, then he says what there was, when we made known unto you, the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were witnesses of His majesty, eyewitnesses of His majesty. So Paul wanted to make sure that the brethren there in the early part of the church knew that they wasn't following cunning device fables, just things made up by man, but they actually saw and were there and, and seen the things that happened, and the Holy Spirit guided them to write down the things that the Holy Spirit wanted them to know concerning the kingdom or the church of the living God, and that those were not cunningly devised fables. What are cunningly devised fables are man's ideas. Most of them you can trace right down through history and find their beginnings where man thought that he had a little bit better way. But he said that they were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And one of the cunningly devised fables of today's time is people believe that they're a witness of Jesus. And they go about witnessing about Jesus. What does the Bible say concerning being a witness for Jesus? Well, let's turn to Luke, the 24th chapter. Read verses 36 through 48. Luke 24, 36 through 48. And as they, and as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. I want to ask you right now, who is them? Well, we're going to have to read on and find out. And saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do your thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And, and while they yet believed not for joy and wonder, he said unto them, have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and that honeycomb, and he took it and did eat it before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was wet yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms. And he opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. So Jesus Christ here had come back after being crucified on Calvary's cross, come back, he had first went to Hades and come back and showed himself to the apostles. That was the they. And as they thus spake, as the apostles spake, Jesus stood unto them and said unto them, Peace be still. They was afraid because they thought he was a ghost. And he said, a ghost don't have flesh and blood, guys. And while they still didn't believe uh, because they were in such amazed wonder, he said, do you have any meat? And they gave him some rolled fish and he ate it in front of them to prove that he wasn't a spirit. But he was truly Christ. Okay? And then he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooves Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. Who were witnesses? Who was he talking to? The apostles. You know, there's, there's a group of Christian believers, a lot of them very loyal hearted, that actually have the witness in their name. I don't 
think they was an apostle, though. I don't think they were there when Christ was walking around. They were going about. They go all over the place. And, and you see this in other denominations, too, where they say, oh, we're going to go witness this Saturday or this Sunday. We're going to go witness to people. People, I wasn't there with the apostles. I'm not a witness. But what I can do is preach the gospel of Christ. And I can teach them the plan of salvation. And that's what we do today. We don't witness because we weren't there. You want a little more proof? Turn to John, the 15th chapter, verse 27. John 15 and 27. <clears throat> it says, And ye, who's he talking to? Well, the apostles there, if you read up farther, he's reading to the apostles. The very verse before it says, that When the Comforter come, and whom I will send from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, and he shall testify of me. So we know that he is talking to the, to the apostles themselves there. He says, And ye also shall bear witness. Okay? The people that say that they're bearing witness today needs to listen to the last half of this verse. Because ye have been with me from the beginning. The people that say they're witnessing today were not with Christ in the beginning. It's a cunningly devised fable. Because it's not from God, it's from man. Want a little more? Turn to Acts, the first chapter. Verse 21 and 22. <clears throat> says, Wherefore of these men which have company with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, just during the lifespan of Jesus, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. That's what they're supposed to be witnessing is the resurrection. That's what the apostles did was they were witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus and they went and preached that. But we as witnesses, no, we weren't there. We can't be a witness. It's not our job. Our job is to teach the gospel of Christ. Him preach Jesus and Him crucified. But as a witness, it's impossible to be a witness. Have you ever seen a court of law that uh, went back to a case maybe three or four or five, six, eight years, ten years before, opened up a case, and they brought in a witness for it? And the judge says, okay, tell me your story. Well, I wasn't there, but that ain't a witness. You weren't there. Couldn't have been a witness in this court case. It would have been impossible because you weren't there. We can't be witnesses because we weren't there. Now, can we testify? Can we preach? You bet we can. We can tell the world of a Savior who died a long time ago for us. We can show them historical records. We can show them uh, archaeological digs of Genesis flood. We can show them all manner of things if we'll study and find them. But to be a witness, what an ours to be, it was the apostles. They were there. Another cunningly devised fable that we hear a lot today is you don't have to be baptized. I don't know where in the world they get that one from. Well, well I do, but it still don't make no sense to me. I was uh, with an old, old friend of mine one time, old uh, teacher of mine, and uh, I just got to his place. I was getting some hay or something. I don't know what I was doing. But uh, he told me, he said, man, I read this, been reading on this book, and said uh, this, this morning I read where it writer said that the moment you believe you're saved. I looked at him and I said, Is Jesus a liar then? Turn to Mark 16 and 16. And that's what I quoted him. Mark 16 and 16. I'm going to flip over and make sure I don't misquote it. Jesus is speaking. The words are in red. He said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. You know why the unbelievers damned? Because <laughs> he ain't ever baptized. That's why. I believe that it takes faith to be saved. I believe there's 17 things in the new scriptures that tells us, saves us. 
It takes every single one of them communitively to be saved. Let me give you an example. You're going to hire Brother Gene back here to build your pole barn. You want a slab in it? You want a walk-in door? You want a garage door? You want four windows? You want colored sheet metal? And you're paying for that building. And he quits at the last slab and says, there's your building. That's the way people preach salvation today. It takes more than one thing to be saved. But they want to stop at faith and say, because the Bible says it takes faith, that's all it takes. No, it's not. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized. I'm no English major, but and is means you've got to put the two together to make it happen. Let's turn to Isaiah, the 59th chapter, read verses 1 and 2, and we're going to actually come back to this. This is a, but quickly becoming one of my go-to verses. Because it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. In other words, what the writer here is saying is, God is able to save. The ability is there. God is able. Neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Here it's talking about prayer. God can hear prayers. But, but, your iniquities or sins have separated, actually iniquities is lawlessness, which sins transgression law, that your iniquities have separated between you and your God. So our lawlessness, the times of our lives of our lawlessness have taken us away from God. And your sins have hid His face from you because God can't bear sin that He will not hear you. So, whenever we are in a sinful state, we've taken ourselves out of the presence of God to the point He's no longer there for us and he will not hear us. Turn to 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verses 9 through 11. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Unrighteousness is not in the kingdom of God. The people that commit these sins, and while this is a partial list, it is not a full list, but it gives you the idea, the idea of sin. These can't inherit the kingdom of God. So how do we get to where we can inherit the kingdom? And why is inheriting the kingdom important? Well, two different scriptures will answer both those questions. Acts 22 and 16. This is the Apostle Paul recounting his story of his conversion. Acts 22 and 16. And I think maybe in the next year, I'm going to get y'all together a lesson on the conversion of Saul. Because if Saul was converted, he was renamed Paul later. And, and ask a few questions in it. But I'm going to ask one today. Acts 22, 16. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins calling on the name of the Lord. So how do we get rid of this unrighteousness, this list of sins that we committed against the Lord? We arise and we're baptized and we're, sins are washed away in the blood of the Lamb, calling on the name of the Lord. A lot of people mistake this calling on the name of the Lord and, oh, Lord Jesus, come save me. No, whenever you're baptized, you're baptized in the name of or by the authority of God the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, you're baptized in. And whenever you're baptized, you're baptized calling on the name of the Lord. The, the person baptized you, I will baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And by their authority, this action is taking place. And that's how you call upon the name of the Lord. 
and then your unrighteousness is washed away. Now I ask you, I said, why is having our sins washed away? Why is being a member of the kingdom important? Whenever our sins were washed away when we were baptized, we, before that time, we were split apart by our own choice, by our own decision, because as babies, we were perfect. It's whenever we understood sin and sin that we separated ourselves from Christ and become the unrighteous. And when we're baptized and our sins are washed away, we are reconciled back to God and become a child of God. Why is that important? Because when we're baptized, we're also... Baptism doesn't just wash away your sins. It also puts you into the church, the body of Christ, which is the kingdom. And that's important because in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, in verse 24... It says, then cometh the end. The end of what? Well, the end of the world is what it's talking about here. When he comes back in flame and fury to devour this world with fire and burns it up to a pile of ash, and there's a whole lot of stuff about it just being renovated and, and uh, burned off, and he's going to bring heaven back down here, and that's the biggest malarkey I ever heard in my life. Because uh, when I throw a log in the stove, there ain't nothing left but ash. There ain't no reborn log in that stove. I don't believe it. But when the end comes, then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom, the church, the body, those that are saved, those that are sin free, to God. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to go. That's why I got to be baptized. Just a couple of the reasons. We could go on for about three hours on the necessity of baptism. At one time I was working on and I've, I've sit, slacked off and going about a seven or eight part series on why we've got to be baptized on different aspects of it. So it's not just one thing that baptism does for us, but it does wash away our sins. That's most important. It puts us in the body of Christ, which is the kingdom of our God. Jude talks about us being preserved in Christ. When you're baptized, you're preserved just like a cucumber putting in a jar and made into a pickle. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you how that happens because I don't know, but I like pickles is all I can tell you. But that pickle, pickle's preserved. Just like we're preserved in Christ. So you can nickname me pickle if you want to. I don't care. Okay? Another cunningly devised fable. And you'll hear, you'll hear a lot of a lot of your good friends, good, honest hearted, sincere, Christ believing friends tell you I have a personal relationship with God. Let's turn to Acts, the 10th chapter, and read verse 34. Oops. Acts, the 10th chapter, and verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive. That God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Was Peter lying through the Holy Spirit? And he said, Paul, oh, well, you know, that don't say that I'll take away our personal relationship. Yeah, it does. You see, I have my own, my own truck. Okay. That's a personal possession of mine. You know what that means? That means you don't own that truck. I also own my own home. Bank owns it. Like my truck. I'm just paying it off. <laughs> we understand that when I'm talking. You know what that means? That means you don't own that home. It's mine. It's my personal possession. I also have my own clothes. And I'm like, see Jesse Buckner wear them. I don't think he can fit them, y'all. See, these is my clothes. They fit me. Whenever people talk about having a personal relationship with Christ, what they're saying is, I got one you can't have. Now, they may not mean it that way, but that's the way logic takes it. We don't have a personal relationship. Let me ask you this. What good is a personal relationship with Christ? I personally don't have one. I'll, I'll tell you that right now. You know why? Because I got a communal relationship with Christ. This congregation, 
They're all my brothers and sisters. The congregation at Pine Mountain, they're my brothers and sisters. The congregations in Washington and New Mexico and Texas, they're my brothers and sisters, all in Christ. Because it's in Christ we have a relationship most definitely. It's a relationship based on our obedience and His willingness to forgive me because of my obedience. But I don't have one that nobody else has. The Bible never talks about one that way. It always talks about us being a community in Christ. That's why this is called the communion and not the individualism. Everybody partakes and Christ is there with us. Just like the body. The body's not one. The body's many members. Another well-accepted uh, cunningly devised fable is the sinner's prayer. I, I got a, a paper, and I actually printed several copies of this paper. I gave one to Robert years ago. I seen it in his Bible uh, Wednesday, I believe it was, at church, at Bible study. This is written uh, by a guy who's got a website. He's a preacher from Canada, so I thought, so I think. Uh, it's at Bible.ca, uh, and it's paper on the sinner's prayer. Uh, it's a, basically a brief of a book that a guy is writing about the sinner's prayer. I'm not going to read you all six pages. But if you want a copy of it, I brought some with me. I brought three extra copies, so I'm going to give you this one. So i got four copies. Or I'll show you where to go to it. He begins by saying, The earliest notion of sinner's prayer is less than 500 years old. It wasn't a formalized as a theology until around the time of Billy Graham. No one in the Bible ever prayed for their initial salvation. However, they did believe, repent, confess Jesus, and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins. The sinner's prayer is an innovation that thwarts God's plan of salvation. First, they replaced believer's baptism by infant baptism and sprinkling. Second, they later replaced baptism altogether with the sinner's prayer. So the baptism is no longer even a part of the plan of salvation. If you prayed the sinner's prayer for your salvation, you're still lost in your sins because it is not what God said to do. You can go on through this. You can... Uh, Study it if you want. Like I said, I've got copies. And find how that the last several hundred years, starting with about 1800 and, or excuse me, 1500 and something, I do want to bring in one point if I can find it. Uh, let's see. Let me try to find something of a date here. Oh, it's talking about the mid-1700s. Not particularly about this guy, but they reference this guy in the mid-1700s, so I'm going to say that it was in that time period. It says, in fact, and I'm going to butcher this name because I, I don't even know if it's German or what. I think so. Holdrich Zwingli put forth this idea for the very first time about, their, about praying yourself into the church. See, before the 1700s, it wasn't even heard of. This is a real new development within Christendom, the sinner's prayer. But like most things, it really took off fast. Turn to Philippians 4 9. Because you may ask, Brother Paul, why in the world is it so important to you that we find a place in history where man started things? Well, turn to Philippians 4 9. If I can find a date where a man started something inside the church, such as the sinner's prayer or, or any such thing, multiple cups on the table, uh, not breaking the bread, anything that that content that's not like the Bible says, this is this is my verse. The Apostle Paul writing to the Philippians said, those things, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace shall be with you 
So on the flip side of that, if we're not doing what the Apostle Paul taught us and received and heard and seen in him, we ain't got God peace with us anymore. Because he said if I stay in the things wherein he gave to us, and them only, the God of peace shall be with me. You want a little bit more? Turn to 1 John 2 and 24. 1 John 2 and 24 says, Let that therefore abide in you, let that abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If, if that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. And in the mid-1700s, they come up with a better way than being baptized, which had been done for 1,500 years and worked just fine. Why does man always think he's smarter than God in every way? I do not know people. We're going to go back to Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 real quick because it fits this so well too. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. People, God can save you. It's an absolute fact and a possibility. Neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. He can hear your prayers. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have separated you. When you made the conscious, deliberate effort to sin, you separate yourself from God. And through baptism... We know that those sins are washed away and we're reconciled back to God and, and have His face hid from you that He will not hear. And up until that time, He will not hear. It's just not possible. Because the Bible said it would. And that's my only authority, people. See, I'm not coming to church for God to worship me and for Him to do what I want Him to do. I'm coming... Church. I come to God because I want to do what He said. Another cunningly devised fable that you see in the church today and in the church I use that term loosely. I don't mean the true, true body believers. I mean people that follow Christ. Is I've had friends tell me I've accepted Jesus into my heart and I know I'm saved. Acts 2 and 47. Good, honest people. True, I won't say true followers of Christ, but followers of Christ. Acts 2 and 47 says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. See, the whole ideology is reversed. The devil's got people's minds so confused that they go about it completely backwards. You don't accept Jesus into your heart. He accepts you by your obedience into His church. That's where the acceptance takes place. I've never accepted Jesus into my heart. Not one time in my life, people. But a long time ago, my faith in the Word caused me to repent of the things I've been doing wrong and caused a burning desire in, in me to be a member of God's body, the church. It also gave me the strength to walk up the aisle and make a public confession of my faith that I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then I was baptized in Peavine Creek for the remission of my sins. And I was reconciled back to God. See, that's how the Bible says to do it. All the rest of this is just cunningly devised fables that we do not need to give an ear to. Neither should we listen to you. I never want to close a talk without offering you a day. Get him on. Of course, we went over some of it this morning. You must hear the word, have faith. Repent of your sins, confess Christ before men, be buried with Him in the baptism. Don't believe man's made up ways. Only believe what the Bible says, because the Bible will tell you what the truth is.
What is this? Shortest lesson I've ever gave? <laughs> they're, they're saying, yeah, I gave you the break. It's deer season, okay? <laughs> if there's any that need prayer as a church for any reason, or any that would like to become a member of the of the one true body, please come forward and let your request be made known. Alright, would y'all all make fun of me? It ain't the link to the lesson, it's what's said in it. Okay. I hope y'all learned something today. Because you don't need to be swayed by a man's teaching and what he thinks in the Bible. And I'm going to tell you right now, neither do you need to be swayed by mine. You need to take the words anybody says, even me or mine. And take it home and study it and make sure it's true. Because it ain't my word or any man's word, this book right here, that's going to take you to heaven. Don't trust anybody. You know, and it, it's funny, you know, me and my dad didn't even agree on all things. We're both members of the body. I know where he's at. There's little things that we can disagree on. But over time, even in the Apostles' time, the Apostle Paul warned of people preaching unsound things. And we know that the things that we that's going to take us to heaven have to be sound. You can't take man's inventions. The Old Testament says in like six different places that it talks about the inventions of man. How it destroyed them at different times. You take them, a Bahuna and Abu, I pronounce them close to right. Uh, sons of Aaron, Aaron the high priest. Sons of Aaron took care of the temple. One day they thought, well, we don't want to do the same fire that God's always told us to. We're going to change it up a little bit. And they, they put in a different incense or something. And God struck them both dead for offering strange fire to them. And it was still fire. Just like faith will still save. But you gotta do faith God's way. That faith is gonna change you. It's gonna to make you repent and confess and walk up the, down or down into the water to be baptized. So that's the way God said that. And anything less is an invention of man. And I can trace him inventions through history instead of the Bible and stop. I know pretty much that that's not what I want to follow. Let us not be deceived.